Emily, florals for spring? Groundbreaking. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. It was it was a rookie mistake. <laughs> I, I, I won't let it happen again. Uh, okay, so today on The Swamp, we will be talking about The Devil Wears Prada. So today, The Swamp. What does The Swamp stand for? We're going to go back and forth. S-W-A-M-P. Some whack ass movie podcasting. Woo! We're working on intros. Podcasting is a learning process for us. We haven't done it before. So mm-hmm. if you want to be um, helpful and give us constructive criticism without being mean, if you're going to be mean, we'll block you yeah. and we'll come find you. Um, Emphasis on not being mean. Yeah. We're very sensitive. If ladies. you be mean to me, I'm going to cry and then I'm I'm going to do something that will maybe put you in jail. So. <laughs> DM us on our social media platforms. We are on both Twitter and Instagram at the Swamp Pod. You can also email us at the Swamp Podcast at gmail.com. We have an email. Yeah, we have an email. <laughs> <laughs> Woo! Hey, hey. Yippee! Yippee! <laughs> I made us an email account. You know, not everybody uses social media, I guess. I guess it's, you know, it's 2021. Yeah. Get on the fucking boat. But yeah, if, if you're you- 40 plus and you want to hit us up, Email. <laughs> but so, if you have anything constructive to say to us, I guess you can say it. Henry constantly... No, actually, please say it. Yeah, please. I mean, Henry, who was on our last episode, The Phantom Menace, he is really constructive while also being a little bit mean, and it does make me cry, and then he has to <laughs> hug me for 45 minutes. But he, he does listen to all these episodes, because he's our unofficial manager, mm-hmm. producer. Mm-hmm. I mean, I'm the, you know, I, yeah. I do everything, but... Well, we'll get him a, we'll get him, get him a name tag sometime soon, but until <laughs> then, unofficial manager. Yeah, so Henry listens to everything, and he's pr- uh, constructive. He's constructive while also being a little bit mean. Um, but so if you could be constructive while not being mean... That would be appreciated. <laughs> Today we're going to be talking about The Devil Wears Prada. I was really excited to watch this movie mm-hmm. for the podcast because Emily had suggested it when we were originally brainstorming. And I had said, hey, I've never seen this movie. And shocking. Fully yeah. shocking. She said, what the fuck? And so we decided to watch mm-hmm. it. And it's, it was really good. I'm glad yeah. you watched it. I'd like to know um, what... Okay. Because for me, The Devil Wears Prada is one of those things that... Um, I don't know if any of you have had cable for the last 10 years, but it was on consistently at least once a week on some channel. Um, you could always find the Devil Wears Prada on. Um, so I want to know what your thoughts were as someone that has never seen it. What what did you think about it going in? Did you have any preconceived notions about it? Give me all of your thoughts. Yeah, so basically the only thing I knew about this movie were like what I had seen from memes. So there are a lot of, you know, Devil mm-hmm. Wars Prada based memes because it is a very widely accepted and loved movie. So the florals for spring groundbreaking, that's obviously a meme. And, you know, the is she wearing the Dolce and Gabbana. Yeah, I am. Whatever they say. Mm-hmm. That's a fucking meme. So I had known like, a little bit for memes, and obviously this got a big cast, and I was kind of familiar with the general plot, but I had never seen it before. I just had never really gotten around to watching it, mm-hmm. but I really loved it. It was such a romp, such a fun movie. What a great cast. What great performances. Honestly, I think that the base plot line of this movie, done incorrectly, garbage. Mm-hmm. Could be trash. It's it's very, like, baseline, stereotypical. You know, you have a bitch who's a boss. You're trying to find yourself. Oh, you change and your friends don't accept that. Like, a lot of really tropey stereotypes in this movie. But I was so willing to look past that for the the great performances. I think it had really great writing. Just, I was constantly engaged. I really liked it. And I think that if you know a lot about fashion, it's a great movie. And even if you don't know anything about fashion, it's still a great movie. Mm-hmm. There's a lot for everybody, depending on your knowledge base. If you could be, okay, in terms of the movie, you could be an Andy or you could be an Emily. It doesn't matter. You will still enjoy this film. (laughs) Honestly, like, not to jump into it too quickly, but this was so Mia Giadopoulos Princess Diaries where she starts off the movie and she just has a middle part and... (laughs) She has a middle part and doesn't brush her hair, and then they just give her some clothes that fit, and they brush her hair, and they're like, wow, she's hot now. A whole new person. Jesus Christ, like, we've seen Anne Hathaway do this before, and I still loved it second time around. I'm still here for it, but it was so much like, what a what a big transformation, and I'm like, you are not fooling me. You just brushed her hair. <laughs> 
So, <laughs> so for context, what this movie is about is pretty much um, this girl, Andy, she's pretty, I can only assume she's right out of college. Uh, yeah, she, she said she went to Northwestern. They really drilled that home. And mm-hmm. honestly, I don't give a fuck. I don't give a fuck where she went to college. She keeps saying that she's wearing the sweatshirt. Stop. Enough. Enough. Stop. <laughs> What money did Northwestern pay to get, like... The props for this movie. Uh-huh. Yeah, fuck fuck it. But so, so Andy, who went to Northwestern, um, she wants to be a journalist, but the only... One of the only um, interviews that she can land is with... What's the name of the magazine? Runway. Yeah. Yes, Runway, which is obviously a parallel for Vogue. This was based off of a book and the book was based off of somebody's actual real life experience being uh, an intern assistant, Mm -hmm. whatever, at Vogue magazine. So a lot of these characters and a lot of these experiences are taken from firsthand actual experiences from somebody who worked at Vogue. Meryl Streep's character is supposed to be a direct parallel to Anna Wintour. It's it's pretty obvious. It's very heavy handed. It's not subtle whatsoever. But so Andy, she goes and she's she dresses frumpy. She doesn't care about fashion at all. They make they really drill that like into your head. She's like, wow, she looks like shit. So she goes and she ends up getting this job miraculously. She does this whole transformation. Her bangs are not at all <laughs> not middle parted anymore. <laughs> she wears Prada, and so she ends up becoming this uh, this this very fashionable to do. Great worker, great intern, the favorite of Meryl Streep. Um, and it really... Pff, what's the right words for it? I mean, it's it, kind of working out for her in the movie that she's really progressing in her career, but she's also really digressing in her personal life. A lot of her friends, her boyfriend, are kind of thinking, you know, she is spending too much time at her job. They don't really understand her whole situation. So if you get kind of a balance switch in which, mm-hmm. you know, her friends are kind of being critical of her situation, but she's doing great at work and she gets to go to Paris Fashion mm-hmm. Week with Meryl Streep, a.k.a. Anna Wintour, a.k.a. what was her name? Uh, Miranda Paradise. Miranda Priestly. Mo- Miranda Priestly. Fuck it. Mm-hmm. So she gets to go to Paris Fashion Week. She goes and her boyfriend dumps her air. He says, you know, you're too fashionable, I guess. <laughs> she goes to Paris Fashion Week, but then she, you know, realizes maybe this job isn't for me. And then the movie ends with her fulfilling her actual career dream, which is to be a writer. So that's basically yeah. the movie. If you haven't seen yeah. it now, you don't have to. Really, the entire movie is about finding a work-life balance and the struggle to find it. Would you say that that's like the premise? I mean, not the premise, but the lesson to be learned? Because I think the lesson to be learned is that if your friends don't understand that work can sometimes go first, then fuck them. Because <laughs> her friends and her boyfriend are constantly giving her shit for putting work first, but she has a higher profile job than any of them do. They all work in, you know, restaurants, whatever, not the careers that they are striving for. And she has this legit job and they're constantly giving her shit for it. Capitalism is a fucking system. It's a fucking machine. And if you have to work a little bit harder to move your way up in the fucking ladder of of capitalism life, you know, they're in New York City. They're in New York City. Rent is fucking high, man. <laughs> I just have to say that if she has to, you know, work off hours, whatever, to be literally the second hand person of the head of Vogue, Mm -hmm. like, cut her some fucking slack. Like, you can't be mad. Um, what was your original question? Is it, um... I don't know. What do you think the takeaway of this movie is supposed to be? I don't know if it's, like, follow your dreams or, like, Um, work hard until you get there. I don't know. I guess there's a lot of takeaways here. One really interesting connection that I just thought of, um... (laughs) <laughs> it's kind of kind of um out of left field is that you're gonna if to be successful i suppose you're gonna have to leave people behind and i watched um this is where it's out of left field i watched the little peep documentary pretty recently <laughs> r.i.p <laughs> honestly yeah for real r.i.p to a legend uh-huh and there was like a really like strong point in it that a lot of people are gonna like want to see you like stay at their level to keep you like accessible and everything like that And you're going to have to leave people behind. And I think that's where um, Andy or Anne Hathaway really struggled at this point. And I think it's honestly kind of shit that she decided to go back. I don't want to say that she went back to her bum boyfriend. Because I don't think that in the end they really gave a clear answer on that. But she really kind of, I don't want to say settled, but... No, 
I don't know if I agree with you here because okay. I support Andy. Throughout this movie, although her character is somewhat, you know, unlikable or you don't really agree with the decisions she's making at some point, I think that she is trying to do what's best for her and she has this pretty high profile job that people are constantly telling her, other people would kill to have this job, you are so lucky, mm -hmm. whatever, whatever. And she's just trying her best. It's a little bit stressful, but she knows she can handle it. And she, you know, she keeps kind of moving up and doing better and better. And the people around her keep telling her, you know, you're too invested, whatever, whatever. Wait, but on the other hand, there's, um, well, that's the, that's the whole issue is that she's fully torn. Because on one hand, she's hearing everyone from Runway say, oh, thousands of kill girls would kill to have this job. And then her actual friends are saying, you're doing too much. You're doing too much. So where, I think it, okay. I think that the, um, the takeaway from this movie is to figure out where, where do you draw the line? I suppose. But also there were times in which, you know, she was really stressed out about work. She was, you know, going through a lot, not knowing quite where she fit in, where she fell or whatever. And her boyfriend, who is supposed to be her, you know, direct support system. She lives with him. Mm -hmm. You know, he's supposed to be her number one. And he's not asking her the right questions. He's not, you know, saying, you know, how are you feeling? Are you doing okay? Whatever, whatever. She, he is just constantly criticizing her for, oh, you're changing. I don't like this about you. You're doing too much for this job. Being constantly in the combative towards her. Whereas I think a good boyfriend or a good partner would, you know, be saying like, I see your mental health deteriorating and I think we should talk about it where he wasn't bringing up the right conversations. And, you know, this movie was put out in 2006. So maybe that wasn't quite, you know, on the forefront, but she is trying really hard at work and she's trying really hard with her friends. But yeah, I definitely agree. The work-life balance is certainly a theme here, but I think that her friends are being kind of portrayed as the bad guys. And I almost agree with the movie's perspective on that because mm -hmm. they are criticizing her and it's just, it's it's tough, you know? If you don't have a job like that, you don't know, everybody's situation is different and they weren't asking her how she was feeling. They were only being crit criticizing of her situation, I, basically. I think that I could honestly consider them to be pretty selfish at this point because there's one scene in the movie where Andy Anne Hathaway um, comes in and she gives her friends tons of gifts. She gives them like over, what was it? She brings in like a-, a Mark Jacobs bag, Clinique face wash. She's just giving them free shit because uh -huh. that's what she got at An work. $1,100 phone, which you can just resell. Like, and they go, and the immediate first thing that they do after like going and getting over their little shock of the gifts is go and fuck with her when she gets a phone call from her boss. Like, she's done just so much for you, so much, like, in that, like, two-span moment. And I don't want to say, like, so much, but she's been so- That's a lot, though. If somebody yeah. gave me a fucking Clinique face wash, I'd be like, thanks, bitch. Glad you have a job at Vogue. Jesus Christ. Uh -huh. And the first thing that they do is say, oh, is that your boss calling? Is that your boss calling? Let me grab your phone. Fuck your boss. Like, you know what I mean? Like, without her boss, they wouldn't have a thing. There's There's such a lack of understanding- of, I suppose, what it takes to work, like, a very successful and high-rate job. This, to me, was very, like, when you go out to a restaurant with your friends. And, I mean, this hasn't happened to me personally, I guess, because all of my friends are real ones and know what's what. But, like, you see people who are out at a restaurant, and they're treating the waitress a certain way that directly tells you that they have never worked a service job in their mm -hmm. life. You know, they're talking to the waitress in a certain way that you're like, oh, okay, so this is really obvious to me that you don't know what it's like to work in a restaurant. You don't know what it's like to work a minimum wage service job and be treated like shit, you know? And that's what her, Andy's friends are acting like here. I mean, mm -hmm. not to say that Andy's job is shit, but they're just like non-sympathetic with her situation. Mm -hmm. And it's like- Sometimes you have a job that's fucking tough and you got to just do what you have to do. And if your friends can't sympathize with that, then they're not fucking real ones. If anything, it's the exact opposite situation of the um, people that have never worked a restaurant job. It's people that have never worked a high-end job and realized how... I don't want to say realized how demanding it is. Because I'm sure that whatever restaurant job her boyfriend was working at was pretty demanding. Being but a in cook a different is, way. Exactly. Being a cook is demanding. And being, I don't know what our other friends did. Um, one of them was like an artist, which is demanding in a, yeah, uh, demanding in a different way. Not to discredit any artists out there, but demanding in a very different way. 
Um, rather than having like someone standing over you and saying, I need this, 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 and this by this time, which is like an hour and a half away. You know what I mean? Yeah. If you don't know what that's like. Yeah. I definitely think the movie portrayed her friends to be a certain type of way. And I genuinely wasn't sure whether I was supposed to be sympathetic with her or her friends. They, the movie was kind of portraying them both to be not villains, but you know, in the wrong. And personally, I choose to side with Andy, you know, Mm -hmm. if your friends can't understand your situation and kind of look at things from an empathetic point of view, then fuck them, you know, (laughs) you got to work to live. I mean, live to live to work, work to live. I don't know. But living in New York City in 2006 was fucking hard. Living in New York City in 2021 is fucking hard. Mm -hmm. It's a tough life. And I guess if her fucking artist friend can manage to pull rent, then that's fucking cool for her. But we all gotta do our different shit. And they weren't didn't seem to be very understanding. Who do you think is the real villain in this movie? Because a oh. lot of, I think, it's certainly portrayed to be Meryl Streep. But, but not even. Like, I think that every time almost a villainous character was introduced, pretty soon after, they do have humanizing moments. Like, Emily Blunt's character, Emily... She, you think she's supposed to be, you know, the the bad coworker, the person who is giving Anne Hathaway shit all the time. But there were moments where you're like, no, she's a person too, and she's just trying her best. Meryl, Meryl Streep, she, you know, she's the bitch boss, whatever, whatever. But she has humanizing moments too. I don't know if there's a real. I guess honestly, capitalism is the fucking villain in this movie for <laughs> it's making all these the people, yeah, for making all these people have to fucking work ninety seven hours a week just to make Anna Wintour happy. I guess, like. I don't think, I mean, honestly, in my opinion, Anne Hathaway's boyfriend was the real villain for being a fucking Debbie fucking downer. Like, just support your girlfriend. She's having a hard time. Oh, she didn't bring you a cupcake on your birthday, boo. She did bring him a cupcake on his birthday. Yeah, she literally (laughs) brought him a cupcake. But he, you know, he's been a bitch about it. It's one of those things. Like, personally, I think, like, okay... I feel like the the whole birthday scene where her, she's at this massive gala and she really has to be there or she cuz there's so many times it's either she does this or she loses her job pretty much and it's very like at odds with her relationship with her boyfriend. But I mean, okay. If he can't understand that that's just what has to happen, then he's a fucking piece of shit. Not to, he is a piece of shit. Fuck that character. He's the villain. I'm saying it. He's the villain. <laughs> Not to downplay like um I suppose relationships and how important, like, your um, significant other is. But, like, if you can't be there for your girlfriend, and I know, okay, birthdays are probably big for some people, m- maybe not so big for other people. That's a very, like, fine line. Have you ever had a friend or a, a person in your life who does their, like, birth week or their birth month? <laughs> yes. Those pe. I mean, no, I'm not trying to hate on anybody, but if you do a birth month... And you expect to be serviced by those around you for the entire month in which your birthday occurs. Jesus fucking Christ, grow up. On the other end of that, <laughs> <laughs> if, okay, in in reference to the movie, if she, okay, if he knows there's this big event going on and that she is compromised, it's one of those things that I feel like your birthday is not the... Sp- specific big event the big event is i suppose in that term in those terms what your significant other does for you you can honestly reschedule that sort of celebration she can go bring you out to dinner like throw on some lingerie make it up to you like the birthday itself is not what's significant it's what someone else does for you so if you're so mad that anne hathaway doesn't go and service all of your needs on this one specific day a year. Mind you, that is a very conflicting thing for probably a lot of people's schedules. (laughs) Uh, That, like, you can't go and say, you know what? Hey, babe, I understand. You had a work thing. It sucks. And I'm a little upset about it. (laughs) But the fact that you can't get past that and just let her make it up to you at another point, like, come on. That's childish at that point. At one point when the boyfriend is a little butthurt that Anne Hathaway has started straightening her bangs <laughs> and has, you know, acquired a certain wardrobe for her work. 
he is feeling tough about it. And so she comes home and she like rips off her, her jacket and she's got a nice little lacy number underneath. And immediately he's like, ooh, baby, this is hot. And you know what? You got to take the good with the bad. All of a sudden she has a, an expensive wardrobe, but you got to see her in that, in that hot Victoria's Secret shit, you know? So you got to get the give and take of the situation. Uh-huh. What mm-hmm. was even was his name? I don't even fucking know. I, it was yeah, so no, goddamn irrelevant. Personal opinion, not that cute. He was kind of scary to me. Mm-hmm. She, at one point, has a, a conflicting love interest with a writer who is a blonde adult. And blonde <laughs> adults, especially blonde adult men, kind of give me the heebie-jeebies. Like, if you're blonde past the age of 10, like, that's just not right. Sorry to all you blonde adults out there. You're gonna kill half of our listeners. You think <laughs> half of our listeners are blonde adults? Jesus. Enough. But, you know, he's this writer, and they meet through work, and he does some favors for her, and she doesn't really do any favors back. Not saying you should give sexual favors to your coworkers, but come on, Anne. You've got a big mouth. She <laughs> literally got... <laughs> Got a big mouth. <laughs> she gen- <laughs> and he was cuter. He was cuter than her boyfriend. Her boyfriend was not that cute. And he, honestly, as some that's a hot take. I think a lot of people are gonna say that's really? a hot take. People think that's a hot take. Honestly, I don't think her okay. boyfriend was that cute. I think the blonde writer man. I think he was a little bit cuter. That's we'll, okay, one, when we post this episode, we'll put up a poll on Twitter. Um, who do you think is hotter? Andy's boyfriend or Andy's um, fling? Blonde, yeah, blonde writer fling. fling. Yeah, I think it's the writer and. Not to say that Andy's boyfriend was, like, a deadbeat or anything, but he just wasn't really supportive and he wasn't concerning of her mental health. And this writer guy, he was like, hey, I want to help you progress your career. Mm -hmm. And that's hot to me. A guy who wants to open doors for you, I don't know, that's kind of (laughs) sexy. That's just what I think. I I gotta agree with you. Okay, one thing I just really want to mention is that, um, okay, as iconic as this movie is, um, rewatching it, I certainly noticed how 2006 it feels. Oh. Um, <laughs> and one thing in particular is when Andy goes and she gets her little makeover with Stanley Tucci. She has her makeup done. Um, she gets a whole new wardrobe with, mind you, she robbed Vogue pretty much. Uh, yeah. Stanley Tucci literally robbed, I'm guessing, hundreds of thousands of dollars from this it's called runway but we're just gonna call it vogue because that's what it is Anne hathaway like raises her eyebrows in suggestion that she would like a new wardrobe and stanley tucci does not hesitate he does not hesitate to give this bitch he's pulling stuff off the rack he gives her shoes he gives her a haircut what is this costing like that it's all hers no question but so what i want to say um (laughs) <laughs> she co- is this one instance when she comes in Emily Blunt's character sees her for the first time all redone it just <laughs> a lot of this movie kind of holds up but this one scene in particular does not hold up at all she looks <laughs> she looks like she got her wardrobe off of the rack at Marshall's I, it's wh- so bad just, my, my number one note of this movie is that everybody who's supposed to be the pinnacle of fashion off the goddamn rack at Marshall's. Jesus Christ, it's it's so bad. This movie came out in 2006, and it's just shockingly surprising how bad the fashion is. Maybe it was really hot back then. I was eight years old. I don't know. <laughs> but it chunky necklaces, mm-hmm. just ill-fitting garments. It just doesn't match. Things that just don't match on purpose. Was that a choice? I don't know. Everything everyone wears... Oh, it's hideous. It made me cringe to my core. The hats. <laughs> oh my god. A little Peter Pan looking hat with a feather coming out the top. And Meryl Streep says, yes, that's it. Like, God, girl, am I supposed to be on your side or not? Like, I can't tell. I want to, um... Okay, because I think I think we're not um, really taking a look back at what 2006 and early 2000s fashion really was at the time. Because... Now that I think about it, I'm thinking of some um, red carpet looks that I've seen, and they're all fucking god-awful. So mm-hmm. if any of you want to send in um, your favorite slash least favorite red carpet looks, please 
any of our DMs are open. We want to see it. We can post some of the favorites that we've seen from you guys. You're so right. I mean, personally, I was wearing gauchos from <laughs> JC Penny. So, like, I can't be talking, but, yeah. like, immediately what comes to mind is that Ashley Tisdale yes. photo that goes around of her. Like, she's wearing uh, a night mask, like, pajamas on top of jeans, mm-hmm. on top of a dress. It's just oh, yeah. amazing. It's, yeah, it was the leggings on top of, like, sort of, like, frilly tutu-y dresses, mm-hmm. or, like, not even, mm-hmm. it wasn't even leggings, almost. I'm being very generous when I say that. It was <laughs> jeans and, like, Uggs. <laughs> Jeggings. Uh-huh. Like, yeah, it was bad. A lot of the fashion in this movie is bad, and considering it's supposed to be, you know, the high fashion of the time, it, it was pretty disappointing. It was pretty... A visually uninspiring personally. I almost think if they were to update this movie in modern times what it would look like mm. and I'm sure people would look back to what we think now is fashionable mm-hmm. and they'd be like god that's awful so I guess you know you just gotta roll with the times but I just want to bring up the number of times that they fat shame Anne Hathaway mm. Jesus fucking Christ so I, I mean not to you know put any certain type of ideas out there but Anne Hathaway is fucking beautiful she's stunning Mm -hmm. she's actress model amazing I'm gonna guess that she's 120 pounds tops literally she's slim she's a skinny Mm -hmm. girl she's tall she's beautiful she could be a model and the number of times that they fat shame her in this movie is crazy in the beginning they try to frame her as being like frumpy and unfashionable they put her in big sweaters and long skirts whatever she's supposed to be kind of a geeky unfashionable type of girl and then they give her this makeover and post makeover The number of fat shaming moments that happen is crazy. If it were to happen in the beginning to try to re-emphasize how out of touch she is or whatever, maybe I could have got on board. Not even on board. Maybe I could have understood that a little bit. But I took a tally of 14, I mean, maybe this wasn't right, but 14 times in this movie, people make a direct comment about Anne Hathaway's weight, about her dress size, that she's too big. And Jesus fucking Christ is this woman skinny as fuck. Stanley Tucci alone made maybe 10 of those comments. And just throughout the movie, everyone's constantly telling her, oh, you're in a bigger dress size than what we carry here. Mm -hmm. Whatever, whatever. And it was just so, like, from a 2021 perspective, it was so cringe to me. Because a size 6 is... Oh, you so normal. Like, mm-hmm. stop shaming mm-hmm. Anne Hathaway. Jesus. Well, also, when I think about it, like, I'm not gonna lie, I was in H&M the other day, like, looking for some slacks or whatever. And I go <laughs> up... <laughs> not to pull from real life. <laughs> but, like, I go up to the rack and it's either... All you have is really, like, size two, size four, and that's it. I can't find anything on clearance for the life of me. You know what I mean? It's really... I mean, I... In that way, I suppose, I think they certainly did a good job of uh, showing how the fashion industry functions. I guess they keep saying, like, that she's a size 6 or whatever, and I don't really know referencing because as a woman, every single fucking store you go into, Mm -hmm. you're a different size. Oh, yeah. You're like, oh, here I'm a 0, and then another place I'm a 26, and then in another place I'm an nine like what the fuck does that mean it's garbage yeah, they keep shaming her for being a size six and just like okay if you're gonna shame someone for being fat like don't hire an actress who's a literal size double zero like it just didn't make sense yeah. to me <laughs> not yeah. cute that just yeah that really like drives it home and makes you i don't want to say makes you feel shitty but i mean it's certainly like I was like, yeah, shit, you're going to shame Anne Hathaway? Fuck, yeah, I wish yeah. I looked that good. Yeah, fuck and me. Even comparably to the other characters in the movie, she doesn't look any different from them. Mm-hmm. It was just such a weird, out-of-place thing, and I'm sure it was very 2006, you know, oh, we're going to make fun of her for being too big or whatever. Mm-hmm. It just, I don't know, it didn't sit right with me. Yeah, no, I agree. Would you say that Meryl Streep is a girl boss? <laughs> <sighs> that is a great question. I... I think she's a woman boss. <laughs> girl just, you know, girl just doesn't say right in the Meryl Streep is a fucking woman and she is the boss here. Yeah, I think that's just playing pretty much, pretty much playing the character of Anna Wintour. You kind of have to be because you are the woman in charge of pretty much the entire fashion industry. You can't say that she's not a woman boss. And 
Meryl Streep carried this movie on her fucking shoulders, I will say. Every, she's a scene stealer. Every single goddamn time she's on screen, she fucking steals it. Without her, I don't think this movie would have done nearly as good as it did. I think great performances all around. I think almost everyone deserves a shout out, but the biggest fucking shout out, Meryl Streep. She got a, a, a nomination at the Academy Awards for this movie, and I think it was well-deserved. I think maybe she didn't even have to change much about herself to act for this role. Mm -hmm. Maybe she just showed up and was the boss ass bitch that she actually is, but it paid off. And I think that it was the core of this movie's success. I was going to say, cause I mean, I agree. I don't, I don't know that I necessarily think that she stole the show. I do think that Emily Blunt stole the show, but I'll get Oof. back to that. Oof. Um, I think Meryl, obviously I can't, I can't not. <laughs> I agree. She gave an outstanding performance. But to me, it's not that it wasn't compelling. It's just almost that it was like, okay, this is light work for Meryl. <laughs> She, like she, could, <laughs> she she could do this in her sleep probably and it would be fine like the most i think for me at least the most compelling part of the movie for her as an actress was that monologue early on when she's talking about how um andy doesn't conceive fashion to be impactful for her and she's like okay well here's the thing is that we chose what you're wearing right now and that was probably like her most standout spot in the movie obviously it was like her big monologue it's like but like like I said, I think Meryl, this was probably nothing for her. She she was really just had to kind of be this monotone girl boss, like not give a fuck about anyone else. I'm sorry, woman. Woman. Yeah, sorry, sorry, woman <laughs> boss. Like I think back to yeah, some of Meryl's other roles and it's like obviously they certainly required a lot more work. And I mean, not to discredit this role because she did fantastic in it. But it's just one of those things that, like... Maybe this isn't far off from real life. I, yeah, I had a, I actually had a... Um, this is a fun fact. Um, one of my friends, um, his mother, met Meryl Streep before. <gasps> yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. A friend of a friend of a friend? Exactly, Thank exactly. God. I don't know. I think it, it's an outstanding performance, and prob it's honestly probably one of my favorite performances from Meryl. But, like, as I watch it now, I'm like, bro, this is easy for her. Yeah, right. I couldn't agree more with you, though, about that early monologue of, like, her talking about the true influence and impact of the mm -hmm. fashion industry, because I think maybe somebody who doesn't really know a lot about it watching this will kind of see things from Anne Hathaway's perspective, which is that, you know, the fashion industry is kind of vapid and empty and just, you know, selling things to people who don't really need it. But I really do think that Meryl Streep's character really emphasizes in this movie that, no, the fashion industry is fucking legit and it's influential and it's important mm -hmm. and that these people work fucking hard and make big decisions and influence things greater than you could even imagine. And I, yeah, I think that movie really proves a lot about things greater than we can understand. And she's like, yeah, you know, you think you're above this because you're wearing a sweater from Target, but no, I chose that too. I decided that too. Meryl's early impact in the movie is fucking cr incredible and you know she does a lot of emotional shit in the end and it's about her character and whatever and that's cool too but i do think that her strong presence early in the movie really sets the tone for like no this is fucking it mm -hmm. i think especially now too because i mean we we've said it a couple of times that this movie is very like 2006 but especially in the time of fast fashion you know what i mean it feels even more prevalent because Things are being seen on the runway and kind of snatched up by um, different fast fashion producers and just thrown out like so quickly mm -hmm. to stay on trend and everything like that. Mm -hmm. So if, not, if, if anything, I feel like this movie, as much as we say the fashion in it is kind of pretty dated, it's more relevant now than it was in 2006, I would think. Mm -hmm. To a, to a certain degree. Oh, let's talk a little bit about Emily Blunt because she's fucking awesome in this movie. Like, Anne Hathaway, she's the lead and she does a great job. 
Meryl Streep. She kind of plays the maybe antagonist turned relatable character, whatever. Meryl Streep's fucking amazing. But I really, I do agree with you that a big scene stealer here is Emily Blunt. This was one of her first really big roles. She hadn't been in a ton of stuff before this. And I would say that this is really what jumpstarted her career after this role. She really, you know, got attention of a lot of people. And she she just fucking schlaps in this movie. Like, mm-hmm. so what a great performance. She, yeah, no, she certainly... Re- I mean, undisputedly, she stole the show. She... I don't know. Anytime that you see her character on screen, you get kind of excited. Like, what shit is she gonna talk? What is- <laughs> Honestly, she's also got the best line deliveries of the entire thing. Like, just so... I don't even want to say deadpan because Meryl's kind of the queen of deadpan in this mm-hmm. movie. But she's such a bitch and it's fantastic. And you get where she's coming from half the time. Like, Anne Hathaway's character... Is a fucking idiot. Yeah. <laughs> she's like, pretty unlikable. Uh, like, it's not like... I can't say that... Em, like, Emily's character is... I mean, she's her name is Emily. So, so mm-hmm. Emily is... Um, she's not wrong half the time. Yeah, like, she's being a bitch, but it's valid. She's exactly, a valid bitch. Exactly. You know what I mean? And she's... Okay. <sighs> Her green eyeshadow, by God, so 2006, it makes my heart melt. Mm -hmm. In almost every scene, her eye makeup is so ridiculously heavy-handed. She just has blue metallic eyeshadow on, and it cracked me the fuck up because she's supposed to be this pinnacle of fashion telling Anne Hathaway what's what. And I'm like, girl, you look like a fucking clown. But it was awesome because for 2006, that was fucking it. It was awesome. Yeah, no, she was... If anything, I want to... So you asked if uh, Meryl Streep was a woman boss in this movie, but I'd say, if anything, Emily is a woman boss in this movie. She's really out there just grinding, trying to do her thing, do whatever she can to get up in this industry. An industry which Annie did not give a shit about until she realized that it could really give her something. That ungrateful Mm -hmm. bitch. Mm -hmm. (laughs) There was the particular scene where Emily Blunt's character closes her eyes and just deep breathes and says, I love my job. I love my job. I love my job. You know, trying to come down from a stressful moment. Like, by God, is that relatable? When you're just, like, having a fucking tough time and you're like, I gotta just remind myself, like, yes, this is Mm -hmm. it. I Oh, my God. Her performance here is so good. One of my favorite fun facts that I was kind of reading about was... I love um, this. That she witnessed a mother scolding her child in a target and the 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 child said or the mom said to the kid you know i am seeing this and makes you know the talking hand motion and i want this and it's the silence and she just said that she saw that and she's like i knew it and she improv that during the movie and they're like god that's great and it's you know really just embodies what her character was about so her ability to like take from real life and put it in her character is so fucking cool Mm -hmm. and i think she she knew who this girl was and what she was about and she was like yes Mm -hmm. i'm gonna bring it and she so fucking did see i didn't think you were gonna bring up that fun fact i like the (laughs) other fun fact that um john krasinski her now husband watched the movie what was it like 75 plus times Mm -hmm. john krasinski watched the double wars project and he was kind of new to the acting business himself. And he was like, I need my people to get in touch with whatever people to get in touch with whatever fucking people to get me in contact with Emily Blunt mm-hmm. because she was so goddamn good mm-hmm. in The Devil Wears Prada. Mm-hmm. I got to get to know this girl. And the, now the two of them are married. And I think that's such a cool story that he... he 75 plus times. That's, that's nuts. nuts. I can't right? say I've seen a movie that uh-uh. many times. No, ever. Never. Like maybe never. Mulan. Maybe Mulan. Really? <laughs> I don't think he, still though, like that's... And I I am not married to Donny Osmond, so you know, there are things <laughs> <laughs> So just he was like this movie is dope and this actress is amazing, I gotta get to know her and now they're fucking married and they're mm-hmm. doing shit together mm-hmm. and that's so fucking cool and yeah. he, I, I'm a John Krasinski stan, and I'm an Emily Blunt stan, you know, mm. I'm, a, I'm a unit stan of them both. He is from Newton, Mass., local guy. Uh-huh. We're a, we're a Massachusetts-based podcast here, and um, he's fucking cool. And, you know, everyone loves The Office, but even beyond The Office, I think what he's done is pretty, pretty awesome. And they seem to have a pretty genuine Hollywood relationship. Mm-hmm. You know, if they get divorced, that'll bum me out for sure. 
Mm-hmm. But I love that he was just a, a bona fide stan of this movie, mm-hmm. and he's like, I gotta meet this girl. Like, Emily Blunt, I can't uh, I can't say it enough, she certainly stole the show on this one. Like, Meryl's performance was great, I can't, I mean, Anne Hathaway's performance was also pretty good. But I, Emily Blunt, she's a steen sealer in this. You know what I mean? A, a, a steen sealer? Oh, she's a steen sealer. She's a steen stealer. I want to ask you, though. So, like, this is something that I'm interested to talk to you about. Because I was having a conversation with somebody a very long time ago. And they said, do you know that Anne Hathaway is one of the most hated women in all of Hollywood? What? And, I, and that, yeah, that really shocked me. But then I, I went on to do some research online. And it's true that people just fucking hate Anne Hathaway and there have been so many film critics you know other people in Hollywood who just have spoken out that say that you know she she's not good at her job she's unlikable and they say that you know that she is too happy that she's too much of that theater girl you knew in high school who just was unlikable yeah people genuinely describe her as unlikable and they say that it, it permeates into her roles. They don't like her. And the term half the haters even kind of came up at some point. Yeah. And I don't know if this was more of a thing that was a bit before our time. But I'm a true through and through stan of Anne Hathaway. I think yeah. she, she fucking brings it in everything she does. I think she's amazing. And it, it was just a shock to me to think that, that she was kind of just liked in this way. But people thought that she was, you know too perfect almost they said that she's not relatable because she's too perfect and i okay. think that this is some sort of rooted in sexism bullshit that you know she can't be happy and successful at the same time she's too good at her job because if this were a man nobody would say anything but i fucking love Anne Hathaway. okay because okay what you just said about her being too perfect and too unrelatable is such bullshit because Jennifer Lawrence got the exact same hate for being too relatable and too much, like, of a genuine person. So, mm-hmm. like, where do you... What's the middle ground? Like, that's uh, that's absurd. Well, I don't think I've ever... No, I, I'm I, I personally, mean, I really like Anne Hathaway. I don't think there's any performance or anything like that that I haven't... I mean, I like, mean, there's, there's certainly a couple of movies that I haven't um, seen loved. of hers or haven't loved but, or anything like that. But, like, I think back to, like... Okay, and mind you, I know not everyone likes this movie, but she was amazing in Les Mis. She got an Oscar for oh, Les Mis. Are you she was fantastic. I'm gone by. Makes me sad. Wait, Anne, Anne, is that you? Wait, I didn't. <laughs> is, is that you, Anne? <laughs> no. She was fantastic. She was amazing. And Interstellar, too. She did a great job. I mean, she was in The Dark Knight Rises, which it was. I mean,. I masturbate every time. (laughs) She's sexy as fuck. And I I mean, I feel like for us, a lot of where our love comes from her uh, is... er Princess Diaries, man. I love the Princess Diaries. Mia Giadopoulos. I saw so much... I don't think you're saying her name. (laughs) Her name is Mia Giadopoulos. Is it Giadopoulos? Yes, she's from Genovia. She's the Princess of Genovia, and her name is Mia Giadopoulos. I swear to fucking God. Mia Thermopolis? (laughs) Giadopoulos is the name of the people who own the pizza restaurant in the town I live in. <laughs> Woo! They're also Greek, which I think is maybe what this well, is. Well, <laughs> Mia well. Thernopoulos, fucking whatever, princess. Of Genovia. Yeah, princess of Genovia. I think that that's where my love for Anne Hathaway is rooted. And I think I saw so much of this in The, prin- the Princess Wears Prada. <laughs> Jesus, The Devil Wears Prada. It was this sort of, the like... The princess probably does wear Prada. Like, zero to hero, sort of, like, she was a flop, and now she's hot, and she's come, kind of coming into her own here. And I that's why I think I love this movie so much. I love mm-hmm. Anne Hathaway, and I think it's so funny that you bring up the Jennifer Lawrence comparison, mm-hmm. because so many of these Anne Hathaway hate articles mm-hmm. directly compare her to Jennifer Lawrence. They say... What the fuck? Yeah, exactly. They say, here's somebody who's... E- also beautiful and talented, but also, oh, she's so relatable. She's so funny. And I, uh, no offense to any Jennifer Lawrence stands out there, but she doesn't fucking do it for me. Really? Oh, do- oh man. I'm not going to use That's... the H word, but I do not like Jennifer Lawrence. Why? Why? What's a, I, okay. what's, a, what's a movie you like her in? I can't Mother! Remember. Oh, my God. Silver Linings God. Play, but you, oh, dog, you got to see Mother. No, for real. That's... Okay, I know she won the Oscar for Silver Linings Playbook, but doesn't like do, you need to no, Oh, she you, fell up the stairs so quirky, so fun. Just uh, Oh my god. Okay. But 
But that you're being the same guys that are saying like she's too re- she's too reliable. I think and, she's too fun. and she's brings too it fresh. though. And fucking brings it. You think she's better than Jennifer Lawrence? I think it, I think Anne Hathaway is a better actress <gasps> than Jennifer Lawrence. Yes. Oh my god! <laughs> I gotta go. Fight? Sorry guys, I gotta go. I can't. I, this is a good three podcast run, but this is I gotta leave. Shit. <laughs> yeah. That's just that's just my truth. Enjoy your time. <laughs> Damn, That's, you I really don't, don't look, what? I, I mean, guess, I mean, I'm not oh. going to say that I'm a hater, she just, you sound, she, you, you, I won't lie, you kind of, I kind of sound like, like a half a hater, hater but, not, but for Jennifer, a Lawrence <laughs> hater, I don't know, I, she's just not my favorite, but I love oh. Anne Hathaway, and I think that the people who give Anne Hathaway hate are fucking stupid, so if you love Jennifer Lawrence, I guess you can hate on me, but... <laughs> I think so. We we were talking about what the what the um, take home message of this movie is, and I think that truly it is that if your job gives you heart palpitations, you should quit. If so, yeah. do you ever sit in your car before work and cry? You show up ten minutes early because you have to give yourself a lot of crying time in the parking lot <laughs> before you show before you go in because that means you should quit your job. <laughs> You work at the library. <laughs> well, I'm not talking. I love my job. I'm not okay. talking about my current job. Okay, your current job. I'm I can't. About s- okay, jobs of times past, and I'm saying that if, um, if your job gives you heart palpitations while you are at work, you need to quit, and you just need to move on. And the people in this um, movie seem to be constantly in cardiac distress. <laughs> Everybody, anybody who is in Meryl Streep's presence, is having a heart attack, and yeah. they need to quit their goddamn jobs. It's not healthy. Yeah. I can't so, say that I personally, actually, I kind of can't. Maybe not like heart palpitations, but like depression. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like um, aggressively um, work. Yeah, okay. Work related depression yeah. for sure. I just think out there, you six listeners that we have, if you cry in your car before work, just quit. Just mm-hmm. do it. I promise you it's not worth it. it. You'll find a better job, and you'll find a job that is probably better paying, honest. Okay, I can't say that. So, But you will probably find one that's better paying. Maybe not right off the bat, but sometime soon-ish. <laughs> sometime in the future? So I, I think before we were talking about the presence of, like, a work-life balance and, you know, balancing your, your relationships and your work and whatever... But I also think that it's important to bring up the, like, mental health mm. and work balance because I think we see that a lot with Anne Hathaway's character in this movie, that she is kind of really struggling at some points. And she's like, nobody is helping me. Nobody is, you know, giving me a hand. And it, She really had no support system at all. Yeah. And just a mental health work balance is almost as important, mm-hmm. if not more important, than that whole work-life balance, you know, with your friends your boyfriend, whatever, and work. You gotta mm-hmm. take care of yourself, too. And I think that that kind of shows in this movie because at times she's really feeling herself and she's doing great. And she's like, you know, I'm thriving at my job and that makes me feel good about myself. And her friends are being fucking not supportive and shitty. But then at other times she's like, Jesus Christ, this is, you know, taking 110% of my mental effort and that sucks. And that shows in her work, too. So, I yeah, I definitely think that maybe an uh, not as much prevalent of a commentary of this movie is just you know you got to take care of yourself i think i think part of it i think i certainly agree with you i think a mental health life balance certainly goes hand in hand with a work-life balance you know Mm -hmm. what i mean um but i think in this movie a lot it was like oh her boyfriend is mad that she dresses nice now her friends are mad that she can't go to the bar with them anymore and like that was what was being presented as her conflict but i think her character, although it maybe wasn't the most complex or the most driven in this movie, just kind of showed that, you know, you got to know what is best for you. And I think that that's why the ending of this movie was pretty good. She Mm -hmm. got the experience that she needed to have to figure out who were her ride or dies, what you need to do in life to, you know, take care Mm -hmm. of yourself. And at the end, she's like, okay, I'm applying for a job that actually means something to me. Mm -hmm. And now I know who I am. And I think that was pretty cool. I've seen this movie a handful of times, and honestly, it's one of those things that I kind of... I've seen the ending before, but I, it's like, I'll put it on and I'll never get to the ending, so I kind of forgot how it ended a little bit. Um, and I, I gotta say, I was 
I don't want to say pre- pleasantly surprised because I've seen it, but it is, um, it is a certainly a good ending. And I think it is, um, that's one of the things that kind of holds up to um, modern day standards 15 years later, I think. I think it's a good message for sure. What else you got on there? I'm trying to read my notes. They, <laughs> what is that? Sarah? They literally look like a fucking dementia patient about them. <laughs> okay. So I feel like at least in the first episode when we talked about The Incredibles, we talked about a lot of um, hypotheticals that just weren't really feasible at all. And <laughs> oh, you mean like the that. whole episode? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the entire thing. Thank you for anyone that listened to that whole entire episode. You're a real one. Like we said, we're learning. Episode one, not great, but we're, you know, we're, we're trying to progress. <laughs> but um, one thing that I really wanted to point out um, about this film was where does Andy get... Every single contact that she's calling when she's on the run in New York City. <laughs> it's <laughs> I cannot agree more. She's fucking calling. She's trying to get Meryl Streep a flight. And on her goddamn flip phone, she's calling. Like, she's mm-hmm. like, yes. Is this uh, Donatella Versace? Can I use your private jet? Where the fuck did you get her number? <laughs> she doesn't have a tiny little phone book in her purse. And I know that for a fact. Okay, okay, maybe not for a fact, but like, you know what I mean? It's n- it's 2006. There are no smartphones. There's absolutely no way for her to get every single person that she is calling up just at the flip of a coin. You know what I mean? Yeah, it's There's not- no chance. How does she, like, she got the entire phone book maybe. and put her con, every single contact in her phone from maybe, runway? May- maybe. Maybe That's- Emily Blunt, like, gave her the fucking in or something, transferred her contacts into her phone or something. Maybe. I don't know. I do agree. It seemed a little unreasonable that, that Anne Hathaway's character was constantly able to call whoever was convenient to do her bidding mm-hmm. for her because- what the fuck? <laughs> like, does she have just the number for Delta Airlines <laughs> in Is her phone? Mr. Jet Blue, can, can I get a flight? <laughs> We're Delta Airlines. <laughs> like, it just, it doesn't make quite enough sense. But I'll let it, uh, of course, I'll let it slide. It makes enough sense for the film. I just think that for, um, not continuity's sake, for, um, I don't know, reasonability? I don't know what the right Maybe word is. Maybe these contacts were supplied to her by work. But honestly, yeah, a little unrealistic to me that within five minutes of having this job, she's just able to call whoever mm-hmm. the fuck she wants. Yeah, 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 yeah. She's calling every publisher in New York trying to get the new <laughs> Harry Potter manuscript. Are you I kidding love, me? I cannot. I fucking loved that plot line. Mm-hmm. That, that Meryl Streep was trying to test this bitch and she was like, get me Harry Potter. And she fucking did it i loved that that was my favorite part of the whole movie was that she you know a friend of a friend of a friend of a friend happens to be the cover designer for the new harry potter i thought that was fucking hilarious because that's so like how things are i don't know i i absolutely love that see for me i think one of my favorite scenes of the entire movie i think probably one of the more iconic ones is the montage of Andy walking through New York to mm. Madonna's Vogue, oh. changing outfits every time a taxi passes or every time there's like a, little, a tiny little cut for her. Mind you, I know we said the fashion wasn't great. <laughs> it wasn't. But <laughs> the way it was shot was certainly iconic. And with Vogue playing in the back, you, like, you can't discredit right. that. It was... It was pretty top-notch. If they weren't being heavy-handed enough about this metaphor, that runway magazine is maybe hinting to something a little bigger, Vogue My Madonna playing in the background will surely clue you into what's objectively happening here. So fucking funny. So a little fun fact corner. I was reading through, you know, some things about this movie, and something that really struck me was that this movie has the most expensive movie wardrobe of all time. And it makes sense. Of any movie ever made, the wardrobe of this movie amounts to the most money. And you would think that, I don't know, some sort of big grand production would mm-hmm. maybe top this. But it is maybe somewhat reasonable to think that they kind of proposed mm-hmm. this movie, what the premise was about. And then they got this crazy star-studded cast mm-hmm you know, on board. And you just have an influx. So many fashion houses and big designers were like, yes, I want my stuff in this movie because that's, you know, great press. 
And so they, you know, donated things or gave things, you know, at reduced cost or whatever. But so face value up front, the clothes worn in this movie value to the highest movie wardrobe of all time. And I think that's fucking crazy. See, I just think that's very funny. Because it looks because, like it's from Marshalls. It looks yeah. like it's off the rack Marshalls. Because like, it's so ugly. I mean, I think, okay, I say it's so ugly. I think that... Anne Hathaway and Emily Blunt's characters were done pretty dirty in the way that it looked like Marshall's, but I, I gotta say that I don't think that they styled Meryl in the same way. I think Meryl's looks really hold up in that way because, I mean, she's playing such an iconic character. And she, she's I think as a more, uh, like, as a more matured woman or whatever, they did give her more mm-hmm. of a classic and matured style that is kind of timeless and yeah. she's, you know, constantly looking a certain way and, oh my god, her hair, she just, she looks great mm-hmm. all the time and I think maybe a lot of the younger characters they were trying to stay like quote unquote up to date yeah. with the fashion which oh god yeah. but yeah i think maybe in some of the later scenes and hathaway's character looks really good like in her paris scenes when mm-hmm. she's in paris within uh with uh meryl streep and you know she's wearing a lot of black i don't know red lipstick she just she's a beautiful woman so a lot of the times no matter mm-hmm. what they wear it looks really good but yeah, a lot of the early looks in this movie just, ugh, like just big cringe, big yeah, cringe. Yeah, yeah. Um, okay, so for Fuck, Mary Kill, what do you think of the whole movie? Who are you fucking, who are you marrying, who are you killing? <sighs> okay, okay, okay. Um, this is a good question. I've got my Mary. Who am I gonna fuck? Okay, okay, okay. I think I would fuck Miranda Priestly just to be able to say that I fucked Miranda Priestly. Mm. Mary Stanley Tucci's character yes. kill Andy's boyfriend because he sucks. I have almost the exact same thing written down on my sheet. I am just questionable about the fucking because people who work a lot, maybe they just want to come home and sleep. I'm saying Miranda Priestley and my second was Emily Blunt's character. Mm. Hot as fuck, but do they have the energy? Do they have the mental energy to fuck? Okay, <laughs> I think, okay, here's my theory. Okay. Because I, I agree, I don't, but I don't think Miranda, not Miranda, I don't think that Emily Blunt's character has the mental capacity to do it. She is run down. She's worked her ass off yeah. for probably 16 plus hours of that A day. A day, right? Yeah. She doesn't have the time. She Miranda doesn't... Priestley, she's at least like just kind of like calling the shots or whatever. Like, you know what I mean? She's uh-huh. maybe a little worn down, but I don't think it's really as taxing as they, do you as think... she probably thinks it is. You know what I mean? Do you think she'd wear the strap? <laughs> as a woman boss, do you think she'd pipe down for me? <laughs> I don't know. I, uh, that's a, Cause she's oh, worked hard all day. Like, should I expect that of her? That's tough. That's you a know? great question. Okay, because like, mm, like, do I, I think have she's to okay for her? <laughs> Is she she's worked so hard all day. Like, do I have to do the work? Like, Maybe. I will because she deserves it. But by God, like, do I want that woman to? Maybe you just sixty nine. <laughs> Oh, that's more work than anything else. <laughs> Mutual work is more work. God. Okay, I think I think. Uh... Because I think about, what is it, the, like, two scenes where she lets on about her relationship almost, where I think she tries, as much as she tries to, I don't want to say tries to, um, she somewhat tries to separate her work life from her... But she's putting in 110%, like, you can't expect her to just always be there at home because she is just putting in so much at work, and honestly, maybe that's going to be lacking in the bedroom, I don't know if I'd pick her for my fuck. So do you think Miranda Priestly is a pillow princess? I don't. I just think she's knocking out and going to sleep and saying, fucking take care of yourself with the $600 vibrator that I bought you, you know? And I wouldn't blame her, but... <laughs> you think she just... <laughs> okay, so on the opposite end of that, do you think that Emily Blunt's character is so eager to please... That she's going to put out in the bedroom. Or she's literally just Absolutely not. Yeah, I think so she's worn not. down and tired. I think she gets home and she knocks the fuck out. I think mm-hmm. that this bitch has zero time for a personal mm-hmm. life. Because we kind of see Anne Hathaway's character struggle with like work-life balance. Emily Blunt's <laughs> character is putting in ten times more work than Anne Hathaway's character. And and she, I don't think she has any friends outside of work. She has no time for relationships. So, although so, the, the, objectively, in this movie, those are the two people I'd probably want to fuck the most. Who do we fuck, then? Oh, God. The blonde? 
I'm not fucking the blonde. He he clearly did not rock in Hathaway's world because I'm not fucking Anne Hathaway. Ugh, me neither. She seems like a like a pillow princess just generally. Hmm. Maybe Anne Hathaway's artist friend. She's artsy. She's quirky. She's fun. I don't really know. Honestly, I don't know. I they I didn't think, give me enough about her to like really base anything off of her. And honestly, I didn't like what they did say about her. She was greedy as fuck, mm. and then snatched up her phone and said, "Fuck your boss." After her boss pretty much just gave her gifts. Right. I I don't know. Out of a in, <sighs> out of an extremely fuckable cast, out of one of the most Hollywood hot casts mm-hmm. of all time, I'm struggling to say who I would fuck. It's, it's real, this is... I guess I'm gonna go with Meryl Streep. Yeah. I'm gonna go with Meryl Streep. I think maybe on a good day, after Paris Fashion Week... Emily Blunt is ready to put out. And she'd be great. Emily Blunt didn't go to Paris Fashion Week. But, I mean, in the past, she's like, I go every year, and then... Did she? I don't know, this was the first time I ever saw this movie. I feel like this was her one... No, because she this just... This was her shot? Yeah, she just got oh. promoted. Emily Blunt just got oh, promoted. Oh, she was acting like head bitch in charge. No, I thought she'd been no, there for no, years. No. Shit, shit, shit. Okay. I'm pretty sure. So, I mean, I think... Maybe, no, hate fuck. I have Emily Blunt hate fuck you after she <laughs> loses Fashion Week to Anne Hathaway. With her broken leg? That's the romp. <laughs> That's the romp you're gonna have. <laughs> That's what I'm saying. And I completely agree with you. You marry the fuck out of Stanley Tucci. He knows what's what. And you fucking kill Anne Hathaway's boyfriend. I couldn't agree Good. more. I'm glad we came to a mutual decision on this. Yeah. I think you're right. I think, yeah, Emily Blunt didn't give a fuck after Paris Fashion Week. She was eating that pudding and all those carbs like, <laughs> like a motherfucker. She didn't, she didn't have a care in the world. After 75 watches, John Krasinski says, hey, Emily Blunt, you can eat my pudding. <laughs> <laughs> but, but so I think for a cocktail for this movie you gotta go classy as fuck a fucking Manhattan yep we mm. drank dollar store wine and honestly didn't hold up Mm-mm. the whole time I was like a Cosmo a Manhattan some classy ass yeah. fucking cocktail something like that that's you what re- you need for this movie you gotta show up for the cocktails for this movie you gotta feel like a fancy bitch mm. because if you're gonna um, if you're gonna pull Meryl Streep's energy that's what she's going to be drinking. Unless Absolutely. you want to drink a martini, but you don't want to drink a martini. Yeah. And I think for snacks, the relationship with this food mm-hmm. in this movie, the reason, <laughs> the relationship with food in this movie is so fucking toxic. I think they're like, if you eat six almonds a day, yeah. that's how you lose weight. If you don't eat until you feel like you're going to pass out, that's how you do it. And fuck that fucking shit. They shame Anne Hathaway for eating an onion bagel at the beginning of this movie, and I think you should eat a fucking onion bagel. See, on the flip side of that, I I, I don't disagree. I think you <laughs> eat all the onion bagels you want. They're good. Um, but I think the... I, I don't want to say iconic, but I think the line from Emily Blunt where she says, um, I just don't eat all day, and then eat a piece of cheese... or A cube, a cube of a cheese. A cube of cheese. Right before I feel like I'm about to pass out. I think you make a fancy fucking charcuterie board. Mm. But you eat a cube of cheese every fucking time you fucking feel like it. Exactly. Eat all the cheese you want. You make a fat charcuterie board. (sighs) Have your Cosmo. Have your Manhattan. Sit back. Kick your feet up. Maybe get into a little fancy little number just to feel like a hot Mm. bitch. Wear some off the rack Marshalls fucking designer <laughs> you'll fit right in <laughs> uh, yeah i couldn't agree with you more a nice charcuterie board and a fucking fancy high alcohol level co- a cocktail that makes you feel like a bad bitch i think that that would be great for this movie <laughs> and um what would you pair for a double feature what would be a good follow-up for this i that's hard i haven't thought about that. i just expressed my fucking love for anne hathaway and i think <laughs> i really do think that the mia thernopolis am i saying her name right who fucking cares <laughs> The Princess Diaries, I think you watch The Princess Diaries first, and then you watch The Devil Wears Prada, and that would be such a fucking good Aunt Hathaway little romp you got going there, so I think that's my pick for double feature. I think... (sighs) That's really good. (laughs) Mm, Because, you know, similar character arcs, but you kind of see her in different times in her life. I don't know. I I love Julie mm, Andrews. I think... (sighs) And I'm not the biggest... um, sex in the city person but if you're going for actually no i don't know i'm trying to think i don't know because i feel like 
if you're going for the like big New York vibe, kind of, you could definitely mm. do like a Sex in the City kind of thing. But... Like hot bitches in New York for sure. If, <laughs> I mean, and if you're drinking Cosmos or Manhattans or whatever, that's your fucking vibe. I feel that. Or maybe I'm um, like, maybe you could do a Meryl. I love doing like a related actors type mm-hmm. thing where you're like, oh, this person is great in this. Oh, it reminds me of this other thing they're great in. So like for Meryl, you have a plethora of choices. And also for like, I mean, I hate the term girl boss. But for girl boss moments, you know, Mamma Mia after this, what a rump. You're already oh. drunk from chugging your Cosmo. You watch Mamma Mia after this, oof. That would, okay, yeah. I think Mamma Mia would probably be a good call. It's a lot more, it's the total opposite of the Meryl that you see in this movie. And it shows her range. You get a nice mm-hmm. range from Meryl. Yeah, I think, I think either actor-based double feature is, prob- is, is certainly a move. You either go Anne Hathaway mm-hmm. and you go... Princess Diaries, or you go Meryl Streep, and you go Mamma Mia, which is just a time and a half. You can never go wrong with Mamma Mia. And you just switch it up, you make a margarita next. Oh, yeah, right, you seamlessly transition, mm-hmm. liquor to liquor, you're loving it. Yeah, Mamma Mia is such a romp. Mm-hmm. And I think if you're, you're already drunk from only eating a single cube of cheese <laughs> throughout this movie, <laughs> then yeah, it'll be a really good time. Mm-hmm. I yeah. think that honestly, for, upon my first watching, I thought this movie was so fun. I thought there were so many good performances. I really liked it. I was so surprised that I had never seen it before. And it just really tickled me. I don't know. It was so good. So I personally would rate this movie... A seven. Maybe seven and a half. Where do you fall on the scale? I don't want to underrate it because it's only my first viewing. And of course, I don't have that same sort of like nostalgic, like, oh, this is such a great thing. I've watched a million times. But I think I'm going to give it a six. I liked it. I think that there were certainly so many fucking problematic moments with it. Like like the whole, uh, let's call Anne Hathaway a fat pig the whole movie let's say that eating one almond a day is still too many let's say wearing a size zero you know the the fat shaming in this movie was not super cute Mm -hmm. and there were you know some moments that i didn't love but overall i think it was a really fun rob i'm glad i saw it i would definitely watch it again yeah with a good cocktail and a single cube of cheese so i'm gonna give it a solid six it's really interesting to me because you fully kept a tally of how many times. Literally, they... I, ca- I tallied 14. Mm-hmm. And, and that was just starting when I had realized, like, wow, they sure are fat shaming in Hathaway a lot. Mm-hmm. And then I started t- taking tally. And yeah, it was 14, 14 times. And Stanley Tucci's character is just constantly like, hey, Anne Hathaway, you look like a fat pig. And I was like, god damn, she's, she's 5'10 and she's wearing a size zero. Like, cut her a fucking mm-hmm. break. She's just middle parting her bangs. And then as soon as you unmiddle part the bangs and brush her hair, she's, you know, she's good to go. But. Like, I think about it, too, because there was definitely, like, Anne Hathaway, her character almost, like, didn't have the, um, the credibility to, like, make comments about other people, but, like, she definitely, she made, like, one or two comments about, like, oh, these girls eat a single almond for breakfast, or da 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 <laughs> And mind you, I think that they really, <laughs> the writers kind of tried to balance out the fat shaming, almost, by putting in the line of a single cube of cheese, but it was the most pathetic uh, yeah. try- in that way, you know what I mean? Like, that was such a half-assed attempt at being like, oh, but you shouldn't under-eat, too. Like, when you number, when you give it a ratio of 14 to 1, pretty much. Yeah, not cute. It it's was, insane. It was 2006, though, and, you know, I hate to give excuses for the time, but mm-hmm. it is what it is. But yeah, so, exactly. I'm just gonna say, for a quick, it's not quite a trivia, but we're gonna do a little bit of a giveaway to reward the people who have... Listen this far, um, we really appreciate mm-hmm. anybody who's stuck with us and is willing to fucking listen to our bullshit, mm-hmm. so that's really fucking cool. Thank so, you so much. This isn't even a fucking trivia question, but I just want to know, who would you rather fuck? Anne Hathaway's boyfriend in the movie or the blonde writer guy? If you haven't <laughs> seen this movie and you've listened this far, that's <coughs> even a fucking bonus, so please tell me that. But just Google them, uh, you know, Anne Hathaway's love interest in The Devil Wears mm-hmm. Prada, the, the mm-hmm. blonde guy versus the brown-haired guy. Mm-hmm. I don't know. Just tell me who you would rather fuck. We're, we'll definitely put up some posts on our Instagram and our Twitter. But tell me who, and then you will be entered into a little drawing. Whoever answers that question in our DMs, we will draw and give you a little bit of a prize. Uh, just, you know, as a thank you to the people who've listened. You guys are fucking great. And 
we're trash. So, you know, kind of a little bit of a thank you. And just mm-hmm. to wrap up things, um, <laughs> are you wearing the, sh- the sh- Chanel boots? Yeah, I am. Oh, Anne Hathaway. Goddamn. All right. Thank you for listening. Um, make sure to follow us on social media and answer the question if you want to be put into a raffle for a cool little prize. Woo! We love you guys. Thank you. Bye.